San Francisco right. stay. You know, so. All right, so you've been around 20 years, my God. All right, you ready to do this? I am. All right. All right, so five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Michelle Soloway. Michelle, welcome. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. All right, so Dr. Michelle Soloway is a nationally certified healing arts practitioner with training in somatic therapy, polarity, and craniosacral therapies, and energy medicine. She's on the board of directors for the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute, an organization founded by Dr. Peter Levine and dedicated to the development, training, and dissemination of somatic therapy. Dr. Soloway has a particular interest in working with professional service providers who are at high risk for secondary or vicarious trauma. She also has over 25 years experience as a health services researcher with a focus on child and family health, vulnerable populations, federal and state health policy, and most recently, childhood trauma and integrative medicine. Her practice is based on core values of service and living her passion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. All right. So um, before we start out here, uh, Michelle, Share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you're calling from currently. Great. I'm originally from Southern California. I grew up in the Pasadena area, and um, it's kind of like I've done a big loop around the country. Um, I am currently living in Baltimore. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, as I, we kind of talked a little bit before we started uh, here today, you know, as part of... Um, I feel really fortunate to have as, uh, you know, one of the sponsors on, on the podcast, the Medical Experiencing Institute, and I invite people like yourself to come on and talk uh, more in depth about what it is, um, you know, somatic experiencing does and so forth. And we'll, we'll get into that. But before we do, it, it's kind of hard to ignore the kind of elephant in the room, which in this case is COVID-19 and what's been going on. So I want to give you an opportunity if in whatever depth, you know, you want to address that or maybe not, or what do you, what do you, what do you think? Sure. Um, yeah, I think this is a very challenging time um, for everybody as they're staying at home and fearful and kind of all of our worst demons can come up in this environment. Um, but I guess what I'd like to say is that it's also bringing out the light in people. And there's so many examples where people are really coming together and helping each other. And just, it's like the more dark there is, the more light there becomes mm -hmm. to meet it. And so what I would say is that somebody mentioned on a call recently that the word quarantine originally meant to retreat. So this is a really interesting time for us to really retreat into ourselves and really do some deep soul searching about what we want in our lives and what's important. And collectively, it's like the whole world is going into retreat. And so I would really like to hold the possibility that on the other side of this, what we come out with as, as a country, as a society, as a world, is that we realize what's really important, love, connection, compassion, mm. helping each other, pulling together instead of division and fear yeah. and you know and I'm, I'm hoping that what we come out with on the other side is a recognition of what's truly important and that that translates into policy <laughs> and how we treat each other we don't need war we don't need you know corruption we don't need you know we don't need those things to yeah. live decent human beings and maybe at the end, I have an exercise that I could show people that's really simple for addressing anxiety, because uh, I know people get very, very anxious. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just don't want to say that. I think what you just said here is right on, right on the money and beautiful. I mean, there, there can be no shortage of such messages like that, of, of the positivity, because it's so easy to get, and I'll speak for myself, it's so easy to get sucked into mm -hmm the the what for lack of a better word the craziness the fear the anxiety and it starts to play as kind of like exactly. this subtle almost subtle but not so subtle background music to our lives that's right and also dissociation you know i think um it's very easy for us to stream all day since we're at home if we're not working um and just kind of go into a 
a place of numbness as opposed to a place of sort of deep-seated awareness and consciousness and recognizing that in every moment we have a choice. And it's fine to stream and watch stuff and distract yourself or do something educational that's streaming or whatever. That's fine. You can give yourself that permission, you know, but just to, to sort of stay in that kind of heart-centered mm -hmm. awareness. Right. Yeah, right. it's very easy to let all that noise take over you. All right. So, uh, yeah. So like you said, maybe we'll swing back and we can do that exercise, which I think is a great idea. So let's kind of dive in here. How did you get into somatic experiencing? It's a, as, as probably with most of your guests, it's a very long and windy road. I actually started out in neuroscience early on in my career. I wanted to do bench science and uh, found that wasn't really people oriented enough for me. And I was, then I kind of moved into advocacy and health policy and working with vulnerable populations and children and families. And I have, I to this day, I'm still doing that kind of research. But I would say that 20 years ago, I really needed something that was deeper and more connected to people. And I began to study body and energy work. So I got trained in polarity therapy and craniosacral therapy. Um, and energy work um, and you know it's really interesting because in that context people don't or didn't come to me for trauma and mm -hmm. yet when they were on the table that is exactly what would show up mm -hmm. right so what, if would, i may what is just quickly what is polarity therapy polarity therapy was developed by dr randolph stone who went all over asia and incorporated a lot of different elements it's based in ayurvedic medicine and the five elemental theory similar to chinese medicine uses meridians it uses some like chiropractic stuff he was a chiropractor and an osteopath um, mm -hmm. and a homeopath he, he was kind of a jack-of-all-trades expert in all of this um, but it's using the five elements that correspond to different organ systems and different states of being and different pathways in the body um, and using that you can identify where the blocks are and then clear them mm -hmm. um, by touch or by non-touch you know mm -hmm. in the energy sense of things um, so it's very deep in the nervous system this work as with the craniosacral work, as with the somatic experiencing. So I would say the common theme of all those things I've studied really are it gets to the cellular level of, um, you know, in, in the nervous system and really wanting to regulate and bring into balance the nervous system and then all the other aspects of the body. And I would be happy to actually talk a lot more about the five element theory and all that. Uh, it's, a, it's fascinating and it's, um, um, and very helpful to understand that, but a little off target with the somatic experiencing. So, so I did that, I did the research and then I had a private practice for, um, you know, I, I still have a private practice doing that work. And about 10 years ago, I was working for a children's mental health agency and we were, this was a, during the time of the Iraq Afghani wars and all the people coming back. And I was living in Portland, Oregon, which was a big center for reserve reservists who were being called up and going over and over and over again with no recuperation time. And we were seeing all of their children and their mm. families and their spouses. And I just remember having conversations with some of the veterans and their families and just, I was just appalled at how much vicarious trauma there was. Um, which manifests the same way as regular trauma in the body. Mm -hmm. And it just was unacceptable to me that there was this entire swath of society of children who did not know what a loving, connected relationship looked like because their parents were traumatized, mm -hmm. either directly from war or because they were a spouse of somebody in war and having to deal with all of those situations. And for some reason, I felt that it was my personal responsibility to do something and take that on. Oh. So I found my way to Peter Levine's work and um, studied and got cert certified in somatic experiencing. So it's a, an amazing modality. I'm just, I love it. Okay, let me just pause here for a second. So I want to go back to something. So you said you, initially you wanted to do bench science and yes. then kind of realized that there wasn't enough of, interaction with humans involved what what talk a little bit more about that 
shift and why you needed mm -hmm. felt you needed the to connection. make that shift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so working in a laboratory is like cooking all day without getting to eat at the end of it. That's how I would describe it. I was doing uh, DNA, recombinant DNA, immunology, virology, because at that point they didn't know as much about the brain as they do now. Um, so working in that context, um, it's isolating. And although my first experience with it was with somebody who was just brilliant and collaborative and wonderful and artistic and had all these qualities, and I thought that's what scientists were going to be like, and there are many scientists who are like that. Mm -hmm. What I realized when I finished college and went into laboratory work is that it really isn't all like that. It's very competitive and people are competing for grant money and people sort of like to collaborate, but not really. And it's mm -hmm. kind of isolating and you're working around a lot of dangerous chemicals. <laughs> so, um, you know, for me, it's like I, it just wasn't enough of the human contact. And I was uh, volunteering to do health advocacy for people on Medicaid and Medicare uh, and going with them to the doctor's offices to help them get their needs met because I was completely appalled at how we have a healthcare system where poor people and uninsured people uh, can't get what they need. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and so the contrast of those two experiences of what it was to help somebody get what they need mm -hmm. in real time, in a medical way, in a healthcare way, and getting their needs met um, versus being in a lab and doing something that's very kind of theoretical, redundant, you know, it's a lot of the same kind of task over and over again. It just, it didn't excite me in the way that being with people and really trying to help people and be of service in that way did. And I come from a very strong service perspective. Um, I feel like I'm a very privileged person in this world. And that has the responsibility in my mind of being mm -hmm. in service. Because the people who have privilege are not in service who will be. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a very simple calculus. So I ended up going into um, health policy and really doing a lot of work around the uninsured um, and, um, and how that's linked to employment and how it shouldn't be. And so I have a sort of a long standing interest in um, a single payer system. I'll be straight up about that. <laughs> I well, I just, I love your attitude and, and your perspective. And it's people like you who I'm so thankful we have working in the position mm -hmm. you're working in. What was it about, uh, you know, Peter Levine's work and somatic experiencing in particular that drew you in that, that what was it there? You know, I think that I was really looking for something that would tie in um, my love of science with um, the body and energy work that I was doing that gave me more of a concrete biological, neurological handle. Um, I think, you, you know, when I think back on it, it wasn't that much of a rational decision. I started reading his books and I was like, I want to study with this person. I want to learn this work. And it just, it resonated with everything that I had um, experienced with my clients in the body and energy realm. And I have to say that once you realize kind of how trauma sits in the body, it also resonated with me personally of my own experiences in life of how things just, you know, get held. And even though in your mind you can say, oh, I've thought about that. I've talked about it. I've, mm -hmm. you know, worked with other people on that. It's still in the body if you are not finding a way to work with the body. Because most of us really are in our heads and we don't do much living below the neck, uh, you mm -hmm. know. And so um, I think it just really, it tied a lot of things together for me. But I think I was just very inspired by uh, reading his book and Stephen Porges's book on polyvagal theory and um, some of the other things I was reading. And I just said, I, I'm going to sign up for this. And it was amazing training, I have to say, because of course, you can't go through any of this kind of training without dealing with your own trauma mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and healing a lot of your own trauma to, so that you can be as a practitioner, you can be regulated and you can understand how to see it. And it was just such an incredible compliment with the body and energy work I already knew how to do. So it just integrated very easily and beautifully in my practice. Now I want to, I want to talk about, you know, you said it was, is amazing training. I want to, I want to 
expand that a little. But before mm-hmm. we do, I, I'm wondering if there was uh, what it was like for you as granted, you, you know, you were doing energy work and you said the people on the table, a lot of trauma was coming up. Mm-hmm. And what was that like for you to experience? Oh my God, these, you know, there's trauma coming up. Maybe they didn't come in for that, et cetera, et cetera. What was that like for you experiencing that initially? Well, you know, it was, it, it was gratifying because, um, so first of all, not doing the somatic work prior to that, you know, people would come in and, you know, I would put them in a very deep state of relaxation. And so sometimes I would talk with them and some, sometimes I wouldn't, it would just depend on what was coming up. But when you, when I saw the trauma come up, what I realized is I was at the heart of the issue. You know, I was in the nervous system. I was in the tissues. I could identify where those blocks were. And then in clearing them, it was like, um, you know, I just felt like I was getting to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is that if it didn't involve talking with them, it was like me helping their body do it, but not necessarily them having the direct experience or awareness. They just felt better when they got off the table, Mm -hmm. but they wouldn't necessarily really understand um, what had happened. I mean, I could explain it to them, but it, it, you know, when you're lying in that deep state of relaxation, your cognition is in a different place. You know, you're not, you're not generally really tracking that. With the somatic work, what's really great is you can help people understand how to hold more without getting triggered, which is really the point of the somatic experiencing. So I don't know if you want to get there yet, but the- Yeah, sure, Leah. The, um, the, the purpose of somatic experiencing and working with the body when the person is really a conscious and aware is so that they can better understand what those boundaries are between being triggered and not being triggered and expanding the capacity to actually hold an emotion or a feeling or a sensation without flipping into fight, flight, or freeze or dissociation. So the way that happens, it's very gentle, very slow, very non-invasive. So you don't ask people to talk about their trauma. You've, in fact, you actually think a lot of people want to, and typically you stop them and say, okay, let's just stop here. Let's slow down. Let's mm-hmm. notice what's actually, what are you feeling in this moment and where are you feeling it? You know, and when you ask people, you know, what are they feeling? They might say, oh, I feel good. And it's like, well, how do you know that? Where is that good feeling? And people have trouble identifying that. Mm -hmm. So it's really bringing to awareness and consciousness the ability to actually know what's happening in the body in real time while you're awake and aware, you know, as opposed to in a dreamy state of, you know, deep relaxation. So can we, can you give an example of almost like a little mini case presentation? Obviously we don't have to use a name, but what would that look like if someone's coming into you? Maybe they don't even know. uh, Mm -hmm. They're not coming in for trauma per se. Right. Right. I had a very, very interesting case where um, a woman in her fifties came to me and was having headaches. And so as we were working with the headaches, you know, a lot of grief and emotion came up, a lot of anger came up, all these kinds of things, which you would expect with headaches because headaches are the fire element and, you know, fire is rage and anger and, um, you know, um, so you would expect that to happen. You would expect a lot to be happening with the eyes and the ears, which in polarity terms are also the fire element. Um, But then as she explored what was actually really going on, it turned out she, she had an experience of, of being hit in utero. Her mother was abused by her father. And she actually had a memory of getting hit with a baseball bat or something. Oh blunt, my God. You know, oh. and later confirmed it with her mother. Um, and, I, you know, that was stunning for me to think that somebody could actually retrieve a memory in utero. And I think what it demonstrates is that we hold this in our body. And Mm -hmm. so she was pointing to the part of her head, 
that got hit while she was in utero. And she ended up having, when she was born, had a lot of problems that were actually related to that event. And so she knew about that, but she didn't connect that with having a headache. So that was, that was just an, it was exciting and frightening and really an eye opener and um, an amazing experience. And then as we worked, um, we had several subsequent sessions. Um, and as we worked with that, um, she was able to um, really identify the core sensation, core feeling, core memory, and be able to hold it more and more such that she did not get the headaches anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was just, that was an incredible experience as a practitioner. Um, and just really kind of gave me a window into, you know, the importance of healthy pregnancy and the things that, you know, infants and babies and as they grow up to be adults, because, you know, she had a vague sense that there were these issues, you know, with her mom, mom and the pregnancy, but she did not have kind of a full story. And so when this came up, she was able to go back to her mother who was still living and say, you know, I need to ask you about these questions, you know, about things that happened. And, you know, so it was a, a real opportunity to resolve something that had been longstanding and at the subconscious level. Wow. Yeah, that was really <laughs> amazing, <laughs> really amazing. And it was a surprise because it just kind of came out, you yeah. know, and, um, yeah, and one of the things that you have to be a little cautious about in somatic experiencing is that when these things happen, um, to be able so that somebody does not then freak out and go into mm -hmm. the fight, flight, or freeze state. And so you have to titrate very carefully, you know, the experience that somebody's having in that moment so that it's not too much. So they, have, they can have the experience of having the sensation without getting, without jumping into the fight, flight, or freeze state. Okay, so, so what does that look? What would that look like in this case? Well, it, what it looks like is when somebody starts kind of going into that place of memory and experience. Um, you know, you have to slow it down, and you have to take it very, very slowly. And so there's this very fine line that you have to walk between kind of allowing that process to play out that gets them over the hump mm -hmm. and that place where you don't want them to go too far. And it can be a very small margin mm -hmm. of where that is. And so um, it's, that's, a, that's kind of a hard place to know how to titrate all the time. You don't, you don't always, always know that. What also is coming up for me as you're talking about this, Michelle, is what's going on with you as the therapist in, right. that, in exactly. that particular situation. Exactly. And so one of your questions for me was an early clinical error. And so this kind of speaks to that, which is, and it's sort of the same thing. On the one hand, there's this intense fascination with what's happening and you kind of want to see it through and play it through and see, Oh, you know, wow. You know, you want to get them on the breaking point. And then on the other hand, there's a fear of it going too far and doing damage. Right. And so the, what I'd say the early clinical error is, and it's not necessarily early, but the real thing is presence because if you're in your own head about being excited about where somebody's going, you're in your own head, you're in your own ego about it. Mm -hmm. And if you're in your fear about it, it's the same thing. It's just the other side of the coin. So the way you avoid going too far or not far enough is in presence. When you're really attuned to what somebody else is happening, you are not in your head about it. And the intuition about where to go really mm -hmm. kicks in high gear, at least for me. So for me, it's really an issue of staying in presence and, you know, really putting aside anything I feel about the situation because it's not about me. Mm -hmm. It's about what my client is experiencing. And uh, the presence is what allows that resolution to actually happen because the presence is where the trust is created, where mm -hmm. the empathy and compassion come in where the holding of the container uh, and the safety of that container is built. 
And so if you're in your head about it, there's something not, not strong enough in the container to really hold that. Does that make sense? It, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And was that something that you, I mean, you've been doing this for a while, mm -hmm. but when you first started out, was that something that was just magically there for you? Were you, were you the one <laughs> or was it something that you had to cultivate and, and talk about that within the context of learning somatic experiencing? Right. Well, so first of all, I would say that because I had training in energy work, right. I was trained one to know how to protect myself uh, so that I can be in presence without taking on other people's things, um, stress, emotion, whatever. I also learned how to create a strong container. And I have to say, one of the things that I was so impressed with the very first uh, module that I took of somatic experiencing was there were 45 people in the room. We were talking about trauma. Everybody was activated. And that room, that container was clear and strong. And I was really blown away. And I was like, wow, okay, those people know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I think I come, I came to somatic experiencing with this training already, um, which was an incredible benefit to being able mm -hmm. to do this, right? And to sort of be able to, because ener you can't do energy work if you're not in that place of, mm -hmm. you know, total presence out of your head, not in your ego. And the minute you're in your head and in your ego, you can't, you don't get the messages, you don't get the information, you can't really do as good a job. So um, I would say that, that learning the somatic work, I had the advantage of having that training already that really, helped me be able to identify when I was there, when I wasn't there and make a correction. Um, but, you know, it's a very moment to moment thing. It's not like that doesn't still happen. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody comes in and maybe I haven't had the best day and I'm kind of, you know, thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner, or how I'm going to go to the spa or something, you know, mm -hmm. get my own session. Um, you know, you, so, you know, you have to, you have to get yourself in a place where that's where you're actually away from all that and you're really in presence and in service to the client in front of you and what they're doing. So it's an ongoing process and it's just a matter of being able to clearly identify when you're there, when you're not there and do something about it. Right, right. But I, the so, energy training was a huge benefit for that for me because I was attuned to it. And also I could create the container and for myself of that happening before I actually saw clients, part of my preparation. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, listenership for this podcast includes a lot of uh, therapists of all kinds, obviously trauma therapists and more specifically people who are kind of just starting out on their trauma informed journey. Um, you know, people shoot me emails a lot, you know, what should I study? Where should I go? What workshop, what course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously we're talking about somatic experiencing today. How vital is it for, if someone's working with okay. people who've been impacted by trauma, how vital is it to work with the body? It is absolutely essential because trauma resides in the body. It's held in the body. You cannot actually think your way or talk your way out of trauma. You can change your behaviors. You can change your awareness. You can do a lot of things like say with talk therapy. And I think there's a very important role for just talk therapy and actually somatic experience. There's a lot of it that is mostly talk therapy, but you know, like, and, and I don't mean this in any way to uh, minimize the importance of things like cognitive behavioral therapy or anger replacement therapy or any of those modalities or EMDR or brain spotting or all that. But you have to get into the body to release and resolve the trauma because that's where it's held. So I think it's, I think it's really important to be, to help your clients understand what's actually happening in their bodies. Right. And in the physiology of their bodies and why, you know, like the nervous system, you know, wants to kind of go in a nice, smooth, sort of wavy way. You know, it gets activated and deactivated and activated and deactivated. And what happens in trauma 
is that it gets activated much faster and it goes higher in its spike and gets stuck in a place that doesn't allow you to deactivate it. Mm-hmm. That sort of didn't make sense. If I had some visuals, I could sort of <laughs> explain it better. But you can think of it as, you know, you're, you're, you're in the river of life and you go down the river and you might hit a little bump or you might hit a rapid or something and you're able to negotiate it. And then something happens, a trauma event that breaks that barrier. And all of a sudden you aren't able to contain that emotion. You're just out there uh, outside your normal course of the river. And you may not even be in the river (laughs) at that point. You Mm -hmm. might be just stuck at where the event happened, which is what happens with a lot of very severe trauma or chronic trauma you get stuck in that place so what what somatic experiencing helps you do is expand the river and allow you to navigate with more fluency the bumps and the rapids and you know and some bumps are bigger some rocks are bigger some parts of the river are more dangerous (laughs) you know some things happen and it's really about our capacity to hold difficult experiences and emotions and sensations and fear um, in a way that's manageable, that it doesn't, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't deflect. But, you know, the thing about trauma is it's foundational, you know, and it's universal. We all have experienced trauma and some of it we get over and some of it we don't. And the part that we don't stays in our bodies until we deal with it. And it colors your life. It just becomes a lens it becomes an aperture of your life. But if you're not aware of that aperture, you don't realize what might be on the other side of it. It's kind of, you can, I mean, I sort of think about it, how people who are seriously depressed are in a very deep, dark hole. And what makes resolving depression helpful is when you know there's something outside of that. But sometimes you're so deep into it, you don't know that there's Mm -hmm. light outside. There's something outside the deep, dark hole right? So it's important and helpful for people to realize that when they have these difficult experiences, and we all do, that there's something on the other side of that. You can get to the other side of that right, in right. a way that makes you healthier, happier, stronger, more alive, more resilient. So for those people who are listening to this and they're thinking to themselves, okay, let's, I'm interested, where, what's the best place for someone to start? If, they're, if they want to learn more about somatic experiencing mm-hmm. or even, even start diving into training. Yeah, so I would highly recommend Peter's book, Waking the Tiger. Uh, that gives a very good sense of the, what somatic experiencing um, can do. There's the, the SETI website, uh, www.traumahealing.org. has all sorts of resources on it. If people just want to learn more, he has another book on trauma. He has a lot of books, but trauma and memory. And then there's many, many other books that people have written around um, trauma. The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Of course, a lot of people um, have recommended that book. Um, Stephen Porges' book on polyvagal theory, which is a very scientific neurophysiology look if people are into the science Mm -hmm. behind it. It's a little um, dense to read. Um, but it, it kind of can give you that sense of it. You can find training resources. You can find where the classes are being held. Of course, now with COVID-19, everything's kind of on hold. Um, Mm. we're looking into ways to provide some of the training online, but the training is also experiential. So what we're grappling Mm. with now is how do you deal with the experiential and the practice side of it? I mean, you can do the theory online, um, and through Zoom, you know, like we're doing, where you can teach that. Um, And actually, you can have sessions online. So the sessions and the group consults, um, I was surprised to to discover that using Zoom for an actual session works well. I I was surprised. I was not sure Mm -hmm. that would be the case, because you really want to be able to identify somebody's breathing, the little micro movements in their face and their body and hand movements and body gestures, you know, you want to be able to see that, but it turns out that uh, you know a Zoom sessions are possible. The actual practice we're not so sure about. We're discussing that and looking into it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, you know, you can go to the SETI website. There's a bunch of resources on COVID-19 um, that are on there and um, also messages about what we're doing with the trainings. Uh, the training is 216 hours. It basically is uh, three modules a year for two years and then two modules in the last year. Um, and we're also looking at ways to maybe modify or shorten that, make mm -hmm. it more accessible to people. Um, and it's just, I mean, going through the training is amazing. It's an uh, it's amazing healing experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are many different modalities out there. So people, um, you know, can check around and see there's, there's many different kinds of things that people can do and that work mm -hmm. and that people like. So it's a matter of personal preference. This one just really spoke to me, I think, because of its inherent focus on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. and the neuroscience and it's so funny because now like all the work I've done you know the my early training in neuroscience and all the work I've done in adverse childhood experiences and ACEs and childhood trauma and you know social emotional well-being and health and the body and energy work and somatic they're all coming together for me right to this one place which is really cool <laughs> well well Michelle I'll have um those links up at the show notes page here at the trauma therapist podcast.com uh Peter Levine's books, um, Somatic Experiencing's website, oh. and the trainings, et cetera. There's, there's two other things I'd like to mention. Please, one, yeah. One is called The Tao of Trauma. This is for body workers Ooh. who are from, familiar. This is by uh, Aline Duncan and Kathy Kane. And um, that's a very good book for people who are familiar or want to learn more about the five elemental theory. They do it through the Chinese lens, but it's completely applicable through the five elements of Ayurvedic medicine also. And it kind of links somatic experiencing with, um, you know, Eastern medicine approaches. So I really okay. like that. And then for practitioners, this is called the Trauma Stu oh, Trauma yeah. um, An Everyday Guide to Caring for Self While Caring for Others by Laura Van Der Noot Lipsky and Connie Burke. And why I like this is because I, I like to work with providers who spend all their time being in service to other people, but don't know how to protect themselves and don't know mm -hmm. how to, to do this work without it really affecting them, mm. you know, because the trick is really, you want to energetically protect yourself, but you want to be available. And, you know, people who go into this, go into it because of their heart and their compassion and their desire to be in service and to help other people heal. Right. So, you know, we tend to take it on as practitioners, you know, all those things that you, it's very hard to sit and listen to people all day long, right. talk about right. terrible things that have happened to them or how they're feeling without kind of it affecting you and putting you in a difficult place yourself. So that's a, that's great a whole other podcast episode. I have yeah. to have you back for that. Okay. I'd be happy to come back for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Awesome. So the Dow of trauma and trauma st stewardship, uh, Laura Avenger Lipsky, who was a previous guest on the show oh of course yeah you've had all the all the yeah. first on the show i feel honored but, to be called among them <laughs> oh please you're awesome i love talking to you um well thank you so much for taking the time to do this and uh, like i said i'd love to have you back and uh, talk to talk specifically about uh you know therapists protecting themselves mm -hmm. and yeah so forth i would be delighted to do that so do you want me to show that little exercise Please do, yeah. Oh, okay. So this is called, we have to try to move my computer a little bit. So this is what I, what I call a closed loop connection. And what you do is you just sit comfortably. Okay, and now you just, just let's contextualize this. This is for what? Reducing? This is for reducing anxiety. This okay. is for, in neurological terms, um, turning on the parasympathetic system, which deactivates you. So this is, if you're feeling depressed and dissociated, this is not the thing to do. If okay. you're feeling anxious and highly activated and fearful, this is a helpful exercise to calm you down. And you okay. can do this, it takes less than 30 seconds. It's really simple. You can do it as long or as little as you want. And what it is, is you sit very comfortably, you cross your ankles, and then you take your hands and you put them underneath your armpits. And then you just lower your head and you just breathe. And you want to try to slow your breathing. And you inhale and exhale. 
and you just take a couple of deep breaths. And then just breathe normally. And you just want to stay here as long as it feels good for you. And whenever you're ready, you can come back and open your eyes. Mm. And what I find, you can just, you can feel how instantly everything just calms down a little bit and goes mm -hmm. quieter and what the what what the physical movements do is it blocks off stimulus from the outside world so that you're really connecting into yourself so that and you're just using your own body to to calm things down in your system mm -hmm. so it's activating the parasympathetic system and i find 30 seconds of this is good you know it just if you want to stay there longer that's great but 30 seconds to a minute is usually sufficient just to have that sense of <sighs> I'm back. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I was I was ready to keep going. Maybe <laughs> I'll do that when we get off here. Um, all right, Michelle, thank you so much. Um, and uh, again, we'll be in touch. Okay, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our talk today. Awesome, take care.